Good evening. Welcome to Arbor. We're glad you're here for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Let's uh, open with a word, of God. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We pray that your word tonight as we study it will be clear and clairvoyant. And Lord, we pray that you will help me speak the words that you want spoken. Open our ears and open our hearts to receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Well, the first thing I'm going to do here is a quick little admin thing. And uh, you can do the same thing. Um, basically, what I'm doing here is going to the website. And then I am going to hit like it. And then I'm going to hit share and share now. And uh, this is a good way to minister, to get the word out to other people and uh, to um, spread God's word. So you can be a minister of God's word. And all it does is just require you to hit uh, share and like, and uh, you're ready to go. So now that these uh, little admin things are done, let's move forward. We're in uh, Psalms 25. Hopefully we'll finish it up tonight. And uh, 25, 18. So let's get started. Uh, look on my affliction and my distress and take away all of my sins. And here David is turning to the Lord, the one who he knows can remove the sins that he has made. And um, once again, we point to the intercessory work of Jesus Christ, which is carried out merely by his presence before the throne of God. And that merely is, is kind of a summation. It just wasn't merely happened. It was something that miraculously happened because Jesus took all of our sins to the cross. Uh, in uh, Malachi or Malachi for us Italians, it said, for I, the Lord God, do not change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And because of that, we can count on God's consistency, his word to be steady and true, and to be eternal. And because Jesus Christ died for all of those sins, he can bring us before the throne of God when we accept him as Lord and Savior and have our sins wiped out. And David knew this because God was the only one who could remove his sins. And in Hebrews 7.25, Hebrews 7.25, it says, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, that's through Jesus, because he always listens to intercede for them. God is always listening to you. Who do you go in that moment of despair? Who do you go in that moment when you, you feel so guilty that, that you can't forgive yourself? Well, there's one person, and the Bible tells us continuously that we're to confess our sins. Put your burdens on him. He's already paid the price. Now, there's a lot of times where we won't forgive ourselves, but that's another story. But God will forgive your sins, providing that you have a clean heart and that you are truly sorry for doing it. And David depended upon the Lord for this victory over the enemy and for strength to accomplish all of his amazing feats. The Bible tells us that it is God who blesses the worker. So if you're having problems at work, why not take a minute and stop and ask God to direct you? Why not take a minute and ask God to provide for you? Because he is the one that grants us that peace. He's the one that grants us serenity. He's the one that grants us the ability to work. Matter of fact, the Bible says God's the one who gives us sleep. So anything you're having problem with, turn it over to the Lord, right? David trusted in the Lord to enable him to scatter his enemies and to scale the walls. Now, the walls were important because they were built around cities and they were a major defense and people thought that in the ancient world the cities were protected by these walls. Um, they were difficult to climb and uh, at this time there were not yet cannons to knock the walls down. So they, they, they were pretty tough. Um, militarily, uh, looking at it from a military point of view, if you're a city and you want to live inside your walls, no problem. I will surround your city and cut off your supply lines. And eventually you're going to come out. Um, walls are kind of ancient and pretty useless to defend. The French set up a series of forts. And uh, all the Germans did was just go around them. They were foolish. So it's kind of the same way with these walls. But a large part 
of the military defense was provided by the walls at that time. So David credits God with giving him military skills and success when he had to defend himself in the cities or when he had to attack the cities. David knew that before the war started that he would pray to God for God to provide the victory. And in our own strength, the walls that we put up, we can't defeat Satan. We can't overcome Satan. It is only the Lord who makes it and gives us victory over Satan. It's the same principle. We put up walls all over the place. But God's the one who can break them down or God's the one who can strengthen them. And David knew the one who he could go to to depend on the victory. Um, I was reading in Iraq, uh, one of our Marine battalions was on the uh, outskirts of Fallujah. And the commanding officer knew he didn't have the proper vehicles for the IEDs, the explosive devices. He didn't have enough vehicles to move his battalion in. So what they did was they left the force outside and they took those who they could on vehicles and they went up and down the city streets. Well, before they started this attack, the battalion commander and the chaplain and all of the Marines prayed to God for victory. This, this lieutenant colonel was very smart. He knew who would provide him with the victory. He knew who to go to for strength. He knew who to go to to win the battle. And they won the Battle of Fallujah, and they were amazed that uh, the people surrendered. He almost had zero casualties. And later when they questioned the people and asked them why they didn't fight, they said because the vehicles were going up and down, they thought there was ten times more of them than what there really were. So in the eyes of, in the, eyes of the Iranians, God multiplied the Marines tenfold so that they thought that it was a much bigger force. And, of course, the battalion uh, chaplain wrote a great book, and he talked about all the men who came to know the Lord during that crusade that they were on. When the Lord commissioned Joshua to lead the Israelis into Canaan and rout its strong inhabitants, he told Joshua to fear not and to obey him in his word. And in Joshua 1.9, Joshua 1.9, he told, he promised, Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Who goes with you when you go into situations? Who goes with you when you go into battle? Who goes with you when you go into work and the stress that's there? Who goes with you when you go back home and you have to deal with family? Who goes before you? There's no better person than to go to than to dedicate yourself, dedicate your time, dedicate your situation to the Lord and let him control you and let him carry you through to the victory, right? And Jesus declared in John 15, 5, John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. That kind of sums it up, doesn't it? Apart from me, you can do nothing. So if you want to do something, you go to the Lord and ask him to bless you, ask him to carry you, ask him to give you victory, ask him to give you the victory at your job, the victory at home, the victory with your friends, and God will carry you through. And in John 15, 7, John 15, 7, how do we approach the Lord? It says here, however, if we abide in Christ and his word abides in us, we can ask whatever we wish and the Lord will grant our request. Now, does that mean, uh, Lord, I want a Cadillac? No. That, that's not abiding in God's word, and that's not what they're talking about here. It's from the heart for things that we go to God. We ask for things that will honor God. We ask for things that will give God the glory so that we can tell others of the success that we have. It's only through the victory in Jesus Christ. Reliance on the Lord makes us victorious, much the same way as it made David victorious, and people observed that and they saw that God's hand was on them. Is God's hand on you? Well, the first way that God's hand can be on you is you have to be one of his. How do you be one of his? You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And that's real simple. That's a real simple solution. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart, Jesus died on the cross, confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Not you might be saved, not you could be saved, you will be saved. And it's because it's with a sincere heart that we make this request and it's with the tongue that we confess. And everyone that Jesus called 
to come to him he called publicly. So if you haven't done that, it's a simple prayer and you can do it any time. So let's go on to 19, right? See how numerous are my enemies and how fiercely they hate me. David was up against some real stiff competition. See how numerous my enemies. At a time when he could be despaired, discouraged, right? He's pointing this out. They fiercely hate me. Have you ever had anybody who fiercely hates you in that situation? I know sometimes when I'm driving and somebody will cut me off or I'll cut them off accidentally, they'll flip me off and I don't let that offend me. I just throw in the peace sign. You know, didn't mean to do it. I, you know, it's just one of those things. But what's the common, back when I was younger, what was the common thing to do? Well, you flip me off, I'm going to flip you off. Right? But it's a little different. How do you respond to things that happen? How could Jesus say on the cross after they crucified him and they were mocking him and spitting at him, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me get this straight. You just went through scourging. You just got the living daylights beaten out of you. You just got carried through the street with your cross, beat, beaten, spit upon. Then you get crucified. You're up there and people are still mocking you. And, and, and you say, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. Are you kidding me? Who does that? Well, somebody who's God. Somebody who's in complete control. Somebody who's been to the Father. Somebody who created. Somebody who knows what the bottom line is. I mean, Jesus could have called down 72 legions of angels. And, and I'll remind you, one angel defeated 180,000 troops. One angel. 180,000. And Jesus could have called them down. Matter of fact, Jesus could have been up there and said, I am and you are no longer and they would have all dropped dead. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus could have come right off the cross. But think about if he came off that cross, what would happen? We would have no chance for salvation. We would have no chance. We would be in eternal sin. Jesus stayed up on that cross for us. He knew exactly what he was doing. Because when he was in the garden, he asked the Lord, his father, if there's some other way, maybe I'm missing something here. You know, it's like, you know, there, you, you know, I watched this master sergeant. I went, in, I was just outside of his office waiting for him to get done. And this gentleman from AT&T was there and they were going back and forth and back and forth and he left. And then when I walked into the office, he told me, he said, you know, if he had only asked me this one question, I would have been glad to help him. And I'm like, well, that's pretty arrogant. How's he going to know to ask you a question? Why didn't you just help him? Well, about six weeks later, I came. I was in his office, and once again, I gave him a, a problem. And he looked at me at a deer, like a deer in the middle of the road with the headlights on him. And I remembered that situation. And I said, okay, Bob, I might be saying this the wrong way. I might not You'd be using the exact same words, but I need your help. Can you please help me with this? I don't know what words to say to ask you to help me. And he kind of sat back in his chair, took a sigh, and he said, how did you know to ask that? And I told him, I said, well, six weeks ago, I was here in your office with the AT&T guy, and he said, oh, yeah, I remember. And he took a little smug smile, and he started helping me with it. Well, I can relate to Jesus. He might have been thinking the same thing. Father, look, if there's something I'm missing here, Okay, but he came back immediately and said, not my will, your will be done. Jesus was obedient to the Father. He stayed on that cross and died for all of our sins. And that is why he said, it is finished. It is done. The free gift that God offers to you is eternal life. And all you have to do is ask God for forgiveness, repent of your sins, and ask him to come in and be Lord of your lives. And your eternity will start right on the spot as soon as you say that prayer. So if you want to do that, we can do it right now. It's a simple prayer. If, there's, if you're sincere and this is your heart and heart's desire, repeat after me. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry I sinned against you. I repent of my sins. And in the best way I know how, I ask you to come into my life and be Lord of my life. Thank you, God, for what you will do and for forgiving me and giving your son. I ask these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, if you did that and you were sincere, you were born again. 
And Jesus said, you must be born again to get into the kingdom of God. All things are new. You are white as snow. God sees you and through the eyes of Jesus Christ, you are white as snow, never to be brought up again. And, and to seal that, God just sent the Holy Spirit to live within your heart. That's why the Bible says, do not do things that will disappoint the Holy Spirit. But that is God's covenant with you. And I would strongly recommend that you go get baptized because following Jesus' example, it does baptism save you? No, but it's a wonderful sign that you are buried with Christ in death and you are born to raise to live a new life. And go to a Bible-believing church. Let them know and get baptized. That's a wonderful thing that you just did. So now you can see David here, who's online, right? 19, let me repeat that again. See how numerous are my enemies and how fiercely they hate me. And the specific occasion isn't really revealed here as to what it is. But we can be certain that it posed a formidable threat to David. So formidable that he, David took it right to the Lord, right? David so fiercely hated that that he described the hatred as violent. And that's how people get when they get to that stage where they're out of control. And this word implies injustice and cruelty. People can be very cruel. And when you look in our society now, and they cause riots and they kill people, all of a sudden it becomes okay. Well, it was a riot. We allow this nonsense to happen. No, we allow it to happen because we're sinful ourselves. Since when does hurting somebody, damaging property, all of a sudden you get a pass because it was in a riot? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But that's how much evil goes through our to our society. And make no mistake, David did nothing to merit this aggressive treatment. As his enemies increased, David became increasingly alarmed and he turned the situation over to the Lord. When you get increasingly alarmed, when you get into times of trouble, who do you go to to turn the situation over to? Well, David knew who to go to. The one person who could put victory over defeat. The one person who could give David peace in the middle of all of this, right? And in Exodus 14, we read where the Lord delivered his people from an impossible situation. And the Egyptian army was on the pretext of fleeing, pouncing on the fleeing Hebrews. But the Lord came to his, def his people's defense. And in Exodus, verse 24, Exodus 14, 24, Exodus 14, 24, we read, And in the morning watched the Lord in the pillar of fire, and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Listen to what it says. The Lord in a pillar of fire and a cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Can you imagine if you were the Hebrews and you were looking at this thing going on? It's like, wow, what's going on over there? Obviously, somebody's in control here. And the only person who could do that beyond their wildest imagination is the Lord their God, right? And, of course, later in the chapter, we learn that the Lord drowned all the Egyptians in the sea, but gave the Hebrews dry passage to the same sea. And, you know, you can remember, um, uh, you know, Moses and, and the picture that is shown um, how the Red Sea was parted and, and how it wasn't until they were all across where God closed the sea and drowned the Pharaoh's army. And that was pretty spectacular. Can you imagine if you were there and you witnessed that? I mean, as you're walking through the Dead Sea on either side of you and there's a wall of water. Oh, you know, I wonder, if, I wonder how many fish they could see at that time. If the fish were coming up, you could reach in and grab a fish and take it for lunch or, you know, <laughs> what you did. So let's move on here to 20, right? Guard my life and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you, right? David asked the Lord to keep his soul safe and to deliver him from pressing danger. Who do you go to to deliver you when you're in a hot spot, when you're in a tight jam? Well, just as David did, did right? Guard my life and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. Who do you take refuge in? During that time of trouble, when chips are down, who do you go to? 
Well, as David did, he knew to go to the Lord, right? And his prayer is similar to what the Lord taught his disciples in Matthew 6, 13, right? His disciples, Jesus prayed, or Jesus asked his disciples and to pray, lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. But God's the one who can lead. Still to this day, he leads. And he's the one, right, who delivered us from evil. And that's important because David's request was from, for freedom from disgrace. And he knew his enemies wanted to defeat him and thereby disgrace him in the eyes of the people of Israel. Nevertheless, no matter what happened, David still relied on the Lord to be his safe retreat. He knew he could go to the Lord for comfort. He knew he could pray to the Lord. Who do you pray to? Who do you give your grief to? Who do you give your request to? Well, it should be almost automatic. Every time I come into a situation, the first thing I do is I just stop and pray to the Lord. I mean, who better to lead than the one who created all of the universe? Do you think our problems are big enough that he can't solve them? Um, yeah, he can. He can do a lot better job than I can, right? Jesus had assured his disciples that the evil world system would continue to persecute them, but he would protect them. And in John 16, 33, John 16, 33, Jesus said, In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. He has victory over the world. Satan wants to disgrace believers, but if we rely on, if we rely on the Lord for protection, Satan cannot win. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Jesus has victory over Satan. He already defeated him at the cross. That what Satan thought, thought was a victory turned out to be the biggest defeat that Satan could have had, right? And in James, he tells us to humble ourselves knowing that God gives grace to the humble. In James 4, 6, he says that. He goes on to urge us to place ourselves in God's hands to obtain victory over our first fiercest enemy. Who's your fiercest enemy? The one that's constantly after you, the one who's tried to destroy everything that God makes. Well, that, of course, is Satan. Make no mistake, we are not battling against flesh and blood. We are battling against principalities and municipalities. There's an evil world out there that you can't really see. But God sees it, and God has the victory. And in James 4, 7, James 4, 7 tells us, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. So, one of the, how do we resist the devils? Well, one of the things that I like to do is I like to set boundaries. When, when certain things happen, I won't go over the boundary. And you should do too. You should make be predetermined what your battle plan is. When certain things happen, what lines are you not going to cross? What lines are you going to know you know, David made a commitment with his eyes. And it's that those kind of things that we need to do so that we can make sure that when we, when we come up against temptation, when we come up against evil, we're not going to cross that line. And um, let's go on here and read verse 21. May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope, Lord, is in you. Only our Savior can claim integrity and uprightness for he alone is worthy of integrity and uprightness because he who knew no sin became sin so that we could be free the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world jesus you can always depend on has never lied neither is god his word is infallible so he's the one that we go to and david certainly could trust the lord to do what was right and to keep him safe. David knew where to go. Do you know where to go in times of trouble? You can go to the shelter of the Lord. Run to his arms. They are always outstretched. He is always there. He never turns his back. So you want to go to the Lord, much the same as David did. Once again, David states in this verse that he was waiting on the Lord. Sometimes God doesn't always give us an answer quickly. Aren't you glad sometimes that, you know, haven't you been through situation we said whoa I'm glad that didn't happen because that would have been bad 
Happens with my kids all the time. When I tell them no, it's for a reason. God gave me the wisdom and the experience and the knowledge to see the trap that Satan has laid for them and the course that they're going to take will not honor God. And how many times has that happened to where one of your Christian friends has done the same thing for you? Or maybe your wife has done the same thing for you. That's why you want to surround yourself with a good wife and you want to make sure you surround yourself with Christian friends who love you and who go to the Lord and who pray for you and look out for you. That's very important, right? And the word here, wait, indicates that David was trusting and expecting the Lord to fulfill his promise, right? May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope, Lord, is in you, right? And that's very important. Perhaps he was thinking of the promises the Lord made to him before his covenant. To make a great name for David, to give him rest from his enemies, and to give him a heritage, and to establish his kingdom forever. And that's a messianic pro promise. That goes two ways, right? And in 2 Samuel 7, 9 through 16, 2 Samuel 7, 9 through 16, listen to these words. I have been with you wherever you have gone. And I have cut off all your enemies before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people, Israel. I will also give you rest from all of your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and your rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men with floggings inflicted by human hands but my love will never be taken from him as i took it away from saul whom i removed before you your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me your throne will be established forever and that was the promise to david it's also a messianic promise of jesus the one to come so let's move on here to 22 deliver israel O god from all their troubles this prayer has yet to be answered, not, not because of the intercessor, but because of Israel's rebellion. Ultimately, though, it will be answered totally, because we know what the book of Re Revelation says. Israel will be redeemed. The same can be said for every child of God who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Israel's troubles have been severe throughout the ages as anti-Semitic violence has flared up like it always has. However, God has preserved Israel. Even when Hamas tried to destroy the Jews in Persia, an incident recorded in the book of Esther, God saved the remnant of the Jewish people, even when Nazi Germany tried to exterminate the Jews. God turned the tables on Haman and enabled the Jewish people to survive the Holocaust. God has always had his hand on Israel and always will. God plans to revive Israel in the end times and restore Israel to himself, and redeem his people. And Zechariah predicts in the Old Testament, Zechariah 13.1, Zechariah 13.1, On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. And that day is yet to come. And verses 8 and 9 foretell that the Lord will keep a remnant of Jews alive in the tribulation period. He will bring them through the fire and refine them. They will call on his name, and he will answer and call them my people. And in Zechariah 13, 8 through 9, Zechariah 13, 8 through 9, And it shall come to pass, that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined. And I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. He will answer David's prayer to Israel. 
When you get yourself in these situations where all hope is lost, remember there's a God who loves you. There's a God who will walk you through the valley of the shadow of death. And remember that key word is through. That's God's promise that he will keep you. So as David did here, trust in the Lord and look to him and turn to him whenever you have a problem. Even when it's not settled, God will give you that peace when you're in the valley of shadow of death to know that you will have the victory. Well, I hope you enjoyed tonight's Bible study. Next week, we're going to march into Psalms 26. And we hope that we'll see you here. If you're looking for a church to attend here in Southern California, Arbor Christian Fellowship, we're in Lake Forest, California. We have a 1045 service. We have a 3 o'clock Filipino service and a 6 p.m. Spanish service. Or find a local church where you can go, a good Bible-believing church that preaches God's Word. If you have any uh, problems or concerns or need prayer, Give us a little tap there, and we'll be glad to come alongside and pray with you and to encourage you. If you enjoyed tonight's Bible study, uh, hit a thumbs up and let us know that, uh, that you are out there. And uh, it encourages us and uh, gives us the opportunity to evaluate uh, how the Bible study is going. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. We're glad you're, you've joined us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you again. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, which nourishes us and feeds us and gives us strength. And Lord, I lift up all those. May your word go continue to go out, and may it be light in a dark world. Lord, we thank you. Use us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. We'll see you again.